distinguished professor at CUNY Graduate Center and Professor Vladimir Markovich, a MacArthur professor at California Institute of Technology, uh, both in the US. So both have received numerous honors, and in particular, they were honored with the Clay Research Award in 2012 for their groundbreaking work on surface group conjecture and enterprise conjecture. So on the day, actually, uh, when their paper on this subject disappeared in the archive, I happened to be visiting Kurt McMullen at Harvard. So I remember very well how excited he was about these conjectures, improved by one of his uh, former student, Jeremy. So today, they'll tell us about this exciting work with the surface of, con surface of conjecture and enterprise conjecture. Well, um, thank you for the introduction and um, for the invitation. So, well, as uh, he said, we're going to talk about these two results, which are actually quite related, and hopefully that will be conveyed to you during this lecture. Um, well, let me first tell you about the, the theorems, what the results are, and maybe a bit of motivation. Well, <clears throat> first of all, in order to understand what a surface subgroup theorem is, um, let's, let's start talking about the low-dimensional topology. Well, low-dimensional topology is a subject that, um, well, the main um, object of the subject is to understand the, the nature of low-dimensional manifolds. And here, low means dimensions two or three. And two-dimensional surfaces have been classified a long time ago. And it took um, basically more than 100 years, really, to achieve the understanding of classification of three manifolds that we have today, and that has been a very long and, in the end, very fruitful journey. And so, the idea, well, the main point, the main the approach towards understanding topology of a three manifold is that you want to have a sub manifold of this three manifold that's, that's a hacking, which means it's incompressible surface inside of a three manifold. Those surfaces turn out to well, the way you can describe them is, is that they are pi-1 injective and also embedded inside of your tree manifold. And then you can cut that tree manifold along this incompressible surface. And then you actually, it turns out you can keep going until you cut, cut, cut the manifold out so that you all, all get the balls. So the point is that, that that's how our surfaces are classified because we keep removing simple closed curves until we come to the building blocks. And, and the idea here is somewhat similar. Um, so, the, so such three manifolds that have such surfaces are Hakkinen. and you should think of all manifolds in this top manifold that, that are closed. This is our standing assumption. Um, well, some nice properties of Hakkinen tree manifolds um, included aspherical, and we'll assume that manifolds are aspherical. So they fill in the holes. And so Hakkin, aspherical Hakkinen tree manifolds have universal cover, that's the R3, and um, Homotopy equivalence among Hakkinen tree manifolds is essentially is the same as them being homeomorphic. And finally, um, the famous theorem of Thurston says that a toroidal Hakkinen tree manifolds are actually hyperbolic, which means that their universal cover um, can be seen as the hyperbolic tree space, and um, they are then obtained by, from the hyperbolic tree space by acting by isometries of the Poincare tree space. So that, that's more or less the classical theory of, of three manifolds, say, from the 60s. And at that time, well, first it should be said that, unfortunately, not all three manifolds are Hakim. And in some science, which I'm not going to define, uh, most close three manifolds are not Hakim. And that, that's somewhat disturbing, except that as a possible avenue, both calls and conjecture in the 60s that every aspherical tree manifold should have a finite cover that is Hockey. So that if we cannot directly understand the tree manifold itself, maybe we can understand the topology of its cover and basically be happy with that. Um, so as, as we discussed in the previous slide, that, that would imply that every aspherical a toroidal tree manifold has a finite cover that is hyperbolic by Thurston's theorem, and then therefore this manifold would be hyperbolic. So that, that, that used to be known as the hyperbolization conjecture, which is now by element the hyperbolization theorem. And so 
This really motivates the statement of our first theorem. Well, at that time, it was also conjectured that, well, in some sense, half of the Haken, virtual Haken conjecture is that um, every three hyperbolic tree manifold, or in this case, every aspherical tree manifold contains a pi 1 injective surface. And then you hope that in some cover you can pass onto some cover of your tree manifold where this surface, surface will unwrap and become embedded if you have an embedded elevation. Um, so I should say that right here that the non, after the Pelham's work, uh, it became clear that these problems are only open for hyperbolic manifolds because one of the results, one of the consequences of the geometrization theorem is that um, all, well, most in some sense, uh, three manifolds are hyperbolic, and those that were not hyperbolic were understood. And so the virtual Hakim theorem was known for them. So our theorem says exactly what um, I just told you. So every closed hyperbolic tree manifold contains a pi one injective closed surface, or um, pi one injective map from S to M. That's just the statement of the theorem. So, well, let me now, that was a topological statement, right? And let me give you more details, more quantitative version of this theorem. And so now, well, I will, I want to tell you a little bit more, give you more information about the surface that we construct inside of every hyperbolic tree manifold. And um, well, the, point, the, the theorem says that uh, given any k, which is a number bigger than one, you can find such a closed surface so that um, when you um, pass the universal cover of the surface, which is a hyperbolic plane, H2, and you can basically map the, um, well, the, the, that map from H2 to H3, in other words, the used map the, between universal cover extends to the boundary map, and then this boundary map is k-quasi conform. So, if you're not familiar with the notion of quasi conformality, um, the, the only thing that, um, well, you, you can replace that by some other, basically, uh, equivalent statement. You can think of these surfaces being nearly geodesic. In other words, everywhere locally, the surface is very close to a hyperbolic plane. And, um, well, you cannot take the surface to Y in a hyperbolic plane. That's sometimes possible, but unlikely. But everywhere, the surface will be close to a hyperbolic plane. And then that's a satisfying. Yeah. yeah, is that a nice picture? So, in particular, quasi conformal surfaces or nearly geodesic surfaces, as you even that we get here, are automatically pi one injective. And in fact, it is geometry of these surfaces that enables you to verify the main property of those surfaces that we need, which is the pi one injective. Moreover, geometrically, at the infinity, so in, in the used maps um, between the universal covers, the limit set of, of this surface of, or the trace of this quasi plane that lives in H3 will be very close to round, being around. And well, there are two things I want to say here. First of all, is that um, if you start in any round circle, given a hyperbolic tree manifold in the universal cover, and you start with any round circle, you can actually find such a surface so that its limit set will approximate closely this round circle. That, that's one statement. And the second statement I want to say is that not all pi-1 injective surfaces inside of a tree manifold are quasi-conformal in this sense. There is the other kind of surfaces that are pi-1 injective, and these are so-called fibers or virtual fibers. So, um, sort of as an aside, uh, when a tree manifold fibers over a circle, over the circle, it means that then the fiber, and if the tree manifold is hyperbolic, the fiber will be a hyperbolic surface of that vibration, and that surface will be, in fact, Hakian. In other words, it will be pi 1 injective and embedded. But the, the way that this surface lies inside of the tree manifold geometrically is not in this quasi Fuchsian sense, and it's certainly not clo being close to being um, nearly geodesic. So um, the surfaces that we construct here are of different nature. So, obviously, um, the main application of this theorem is that, well, let, let's just get that out of the way, it's very important, um, is the virtual hacking theorem, which is 
been proved afterwards and actually quite recently. All of this is really reason we work. So, well, the first thing is that Bergeron and Danny Weiss, uh, using the construction of Sagim, uh, observed that uh, surface subgroup theory implies that every closed hyperbolic tree manifold is cubulated, which means that it acts um, co compactly on a finite dimensional uh, cat zero cube complex. I'm not going to say anything about it. There. Ian Nagel in his lecture talked about it at length, and Danny Weiss, I believe, will say something about it in his lecture. Um, but this turned out to be a very important property. I remember that just after we had proven the theorem, we were giving talks on, on the subject, and we would always mention this corollary that three manifolds are cubulated, but we really did not understand that it turned out to be very, very important. We kept at it, but so the way things panned out is that um, Ian Eagle, using the work of Danny Weiss, who developed the theory of cubulated um, groups and uh, studied them at a great length for many years. Ian basically proved the analog, an analog of the virtual Hawking theorem for cube complexes, which then enabled Ian basically to state to prove the virtual Hawking theorem. So the point is that um, this um, Ian's theorem and relying basically on geometrization and uh, accumulation of hyperbolic tree manifolds of Bergeron and Weiss basically immediately implies the virtual Hawking conjecture. You can call it virtual Hawking theorem, and in fact, number of other deep properties of three manifolds like the virtual fibering conjecture and, and many others really fell uh, at the same time but this was the key point of the virtual Hawking theorem all right so i'll go back to the to the talk so i gave you a, a brief outline and brief introduction to the surface subgroup so let's uh say something about the, um the, the second the second conjecture which is the aaron press problem so i learned this actually from Etienne Gis, whom I see here. Um, that's, that's actually when I started working on the problem. And he told me that he, he heard from somebody or, or read that actually in his paper on Riemann surfaces, um, Riemann said, that, um, observed that the Riemann surfaces, the two, the different Riemann surfaces typically don't have a common cover, but that one may be able to interpolate between them. So that's some kind of translation. So, what, what that really means, well, what we made it to mean, or some many people, various mathematicians throughout history, they, who were interested in this kind of things, they, they said, well, maybe surfaces do not have a common cover, but maybe they can have covers that will be very close in some sense, in the appropriate way. The next best thing. And um, so the, the enterprise conjecture, and which we had proven, is, is a statement of descent, and in fact, is, is the quite strong statement saying that even to close hyperbolic Riemann surfaces, we can find finer covers that are closed in the sense that there is a quasi conformal homeomorphism between them, and we can do that starting with any k, constant k. And if you can replace the word k quasi conformal by k by Lipschitz or some other similar geometric term. So this is the enterprise conjecture. And now let me state, let me kind of turn the pace and state together the surface subgroup theorem and the enterprise as, as one theorem. And in fact, the connection between these two theorems and a line of, a line of attack, some kind of line of attack that eventually worked, was actually first introduced by Louis Bowen. He was particularly the one to, to connect these two, these two problems that don't seem the same, don't seem similar in some sense. Anyhow, the, the joint statement will also reveal a little bit more about how this is proved. So we can we will define later on the so-called model surfaces SR, which are parameterized by a real number R. So these are closed surfaces. And basically, the, the theorem says that uh, given a manifold, which will be of dimension either two or three, and R are sufficiently large, we can find finite cover of the model surface that basically nearly geometrically um, it, well, if, if the target is a three manifold, then nearly geometrically <laughs> geodesically immerses inside of your three manifold and if the target is the two manifold or surface that means that this um, the formation of this finite cover the passive universal cover will be k quasi conformal so what is let's just focus on the enterprise conjecture why is this sufficient for proving the enterprise conjecture is because what this really means is that 
you start with any surface M, then there is a finite cover of this model surface SR and M that are very close. And then if you have some other surface M, uh, M1, and you observe the same thing between SR and M1, then you can pass to further covers of M and M1 that will be now very close. That, that's how the enterprise conjecture follows from this state. So these model manifolds are, well, we will say in a minute more about them. So how do we, well, this already starting to touch upon these model manifolds and how they are built. So the surfaces, so let's just even think about the three-dimensional case first. Um, how do we build the surfaces inside of our tree net? Well, we will start with a collection, finite collection of pairs of pens. Jared will tell you more about what formally what pairs of pens are, and for now I will just leave that. I'll just say that these are topologically three-hole spheres, hyperbolic metric, and when they live inside of a hyperbolic tree manifold, you should think of them as being nearly geodesic. So these pens almost live in the same in a given hyperbolic plane. And in fact, if you assume that they do, you won't lose much. Um, so let's say that we have some very, very fine collection of pens that are very close to being geodesic, and, or flat in this appropriate sense. And then one thing that we, wanna, that we want out of this collection is that the pens are evenly distributed along every closed geodesic in, uh, that appears as a cuff of any of the pens from our collection. And that would be certainly a finer collection of geodesics in question. And then the idea is that every such geodesic, we pair off pants which have that geodesic as a cuff. So we simply pair off, we glue one pants with another pants. And if we can do that, then we already, well, it's very easy to see that we get a closed surface. Now, the way we want to glue the pants is that they are nearly, the bending angle between them when we glue them is very small, so that they basically continue to live in the same hyperbolic plane. That is the idea. We will also add additional, um, well, we want additional, add additional property that we glue them with a twist by one, and the point of that is to distribute the bending error, so that um, if our bending is not perfect, so if our two, there is a little error when we glue two pairs of pants, in terms of the bending angle, then the twist by one will help us distribute the error and makes the argument work. And so let's observe, so this is for the three-dimensional, and this is really the basic idea of this proof. For the surfaces, um, the point here is that um, if you have such a geodesic, you might have a different number of pens to the left and right. And that is, um, well, that, that's a more serious problem that you have to be corrected by so-called correction theory. So Jeremy, how much time did that take already? Uh, so far, it's taken 17 minutes. OK. <laughs> I'll be on, on spot. Um, so I gave you just very briefly about the strategy. I want to just, to prepare you for Jeremy, I'll give you a few definitions here that, that he will use. Well, obviously, we will use curves inside of a manifold. We know what a closed curve is. And the point of this slide is that we want to replace curves by their geodesic representatives. So when I say curve, I really mean a geodesic. And um, now we want to give some numbers, assign numbers to geodesics. And well, if you take a geodesic in the hyperbolic space, you can naturally assign the geodesic a complex number whose real part is its real length of the, of the geodesic. And the imaginary part is the angle that the vector makes with its translate. Parallel, when you parallel transfer the vector along the geodesic and come back to the same point, you will typically not arrive at the same vector. And there will be some angle between them. And this angle measures, gives you the imaginary part of this um, complex length. Obviously, the, the imaginary part is, this, is un, this does not appear. It's trivial in the, when the manifold is a surface. So then all you have is the real length. A um, couple more things. Um, given a geodesic, we want to talk about its, well, I define its complex length. And it's, it's important and useful for our purposes to talk about the half length. And you should think of the half length just basically as half of the, the of the complex length. Ambiguity is that might arise from this definition are not applicable in our case, so we will ignore them here. And 
Another thing that we want to observe is that, um, well, we all can, obviously, we can talk about the normal bundle of a closed geodesic, but here we want to define the square root of the normal bundle by basically cautioning out, well, taking vectors, normal vectors from the normal bundle that are related, well, so that their difference is equal to the half. So basically, they live half away across the geodesic. Or is there any point like this? So, in other words, then you can basically, the normal bundle of geodesic in the tree space is a two-torus. And you can easily see, um, well, it can be described in this way. And then the, the square root of the unit normal bundle is simply the, the two-torus that arises as a quotient of the previous two torus by an evolution, which, which measures the difference between the half line and the complex line. So Jeremy will take over and tell you about, about tens. Uh, right on time. Thank you, Glenn. So, um, right, so a pair of pants in M, which could be our surface or our three manifold, well, there's a bunch of equivalent definitions as there is for curves. So we can say it's a free homotopy class of pi 1 injective maps. That's the basic idea. So we map it. Well, this pi here, let me see if I can draw a picture of pi. So it's a disk with two holes missing. Um, so yeah, it's just it's, it's topologically like a pair of pants. It has three boundary cuffs, and uh, so we can just map it into the three manifold or two manifold in a pi one objective way. Think of that as a pair of pants, or we can look at the action on the fundamental group. So we can present the free group on two generators this way, where the A, B, and C basically stand for going around each of the cuffs of the pair of pants and then just look at this homomorphism that we get on the fundamental group. And the third thing we could do is sort of pull the pair of pants tight in the three manifold. So if I think of the cuffs of the pair of pants as being these CI, so I have C0, C1, and C2. And then I take three arcs going from cuff to cuff. So that's like H0, H1, and H2. And so, and I want the HI to connect Say H1 connects H0 and H2, just for the sake of symmetric notation. HI connects CI minus 1 and CI plus 1. We were hoping to have a whiteboard. Um, so we can take the cuffs of the pair of pants and kind of pull them tight in the three manifold, because they, or two manifold in M, because they map to something not really equivalent to a point. And Having pulled the cuffs tight, we can then say, take these arcs connecting the cuff boundaries and pull those tight to these GD6 segments eta i orthogonal to the gamma i's, right, which are the, the cuffs. So we can pull that tight. So what we have is like three cuffs and then three GD6 connections orthogonal to those cuffs. And it's going to form like two right angled hexagons. And they actually turn out to be isometric right-angled hexagons. The, um, because three of the alternating sides are the same, coming from the A to I, then the other pieces, they cut, off, cut the CIs into equal halves, which is why we care about the half length, actually. And, so, and then we just want that, of course, the map extends to the whole pair of pants. So it's made out of kind of wire and cloth. We have this wire structure that gives us two right-angled hexagons. And then we just have a piece of cloth that fits in. So we just require that those two right on the hexagons are contractible in the manifold F. OK, so that's how we can think of a pair of pants. It's a purely topological thing, a group theoretic thing, or a geometric thing, basically, where we've pulled everything tight. And then, oh, I just realized I'm not using the mic here. Um, OK, so, right, and for. When d is equal to 2, so m is a surface, we can also think of the pants being isometrically immersed. So we just have uh, an abstract pair of pants with gd sig boundary, with three, determined by the lengths of the three boundary cuffs. And we can just think of it as being isometrically immersed in the surface. Right? We can't do this in a three-manifold. And typically, we can't isometrically immerse uh, pairs of pants in a three-manifold, but we can always do it in a two-manifold. So let's see, for each closed geodesic, 
For each closed Edisa gamma i and the pair of pants, we have these two ortho GD6 eta i plus or minus one to the other boundary curves, right? So we have the big closed GD6 and then we have the two ortho GD6 coming in. And then at the points where these eta i plus one meet gamma i, we get a pair of unit normal vectors. So these, this is the Okay, so we have the horsey dance, and we have the thumb dance or something, the, the pants dance. And we get this pair of unit normal vectors, which um, is pointing along these ortho GD6, eta i plus or minus one. And as I said before, it's dividing the cup into two equal halves, so that the, um, the difference of these two guys, we can think of this these two unit normal vectors, they're living in this torus, right, which is the, um, the space of unit normal vectors. We can take the difference in the torus that lives in here, and it's exactly halfway around from each other. So if you double that difference, you get zero. And now, the, we just say the half length of that geodesic, the, there was an ambiguity that Vlad mentioned, and we said, actually, in a pair of pants, if you look at the difference between the feet, that determines the half length of the GDC. And that's the difference between these two unit normal vectors. And we say the feet, or the, sort of the pair of feet of our given pair of pants on that GDC <coughs> is equal to this unordered pair of unit normal vectors, right? So that's determined by the pair of pants and the cuff. And that lives in this thing we've defined, which is what I described to you, which is the square root of the unit normal vector. All right, so um, an R epsilon good curve in the manifold is one for which the half length is within epsilon of R. Okay? So we can't expect really to get half lengths exactly equal to r, but we want to find them close to r. And similarly, an r epsilon good pair of pants is one for which um, this, if you look at the three boundary cuffs for the pants, then each of them is going to be a, um, a good curve, so it'll satisfy this inequality. And now, just a matter of notation, we let gamma epsilon r be the set of good curves in the manifold, and we let pi epsilon r be the set of good pants. Okay, so we have our good pants and our good curves, and of course the whole idea of what we're going to do is to take this finite set of good pants, where we have epsilon small and r large, take this finite set of good pants and assemble them together along these good curves, to form what we call a good panted surface. So just by way of numbers, when r is large, we have about uh, e to the 2r over r good curves. And we have more good pants because they're really defined by three segments. So we have about e to the 3r good pants. And you can do the division. There are kind of equal numbers of pants per curve. So we have about r e to the r good pants with a given good curve is bounded. All right. So let's try this again. So um, a panted surface in M, well, we can think of it you know, it's, it's sort of three pieces of information. We should have a closed hyperbolic surface, S, just sort of kind of parameterizing surface. And now we want a maximal set C of distinct disjoint curves on it. So it's going to divide S into pairs of pants. And then we want to map f, just a continuous map, f from s to m. And all we're going to require for the moment is that this map is pi 1 injective for every component of the complement of the set of curves. So the curves divide the surface into pairs of pants. We just want our map from s into the manifold to be pi 1 injective. And now, given such a panted surface in M. So we take any 
gamma in our set of closed curves. And of course, that's mapping to some free homotopy class of the manifold. We can pull it tight to be a geodesic. And then we have two pants, say pi L, pi R, to the right and the left of gamma. And we wanted to find our shear coordinate. So here, really, I'm defining the shear coordinate in a three manifold. If I was defining a shear coordinate in a two manifold, then I would leave out this two pi i z. Okay, so this is our definition of the three manifold. So recall that I have these feet. I have the pair of feet uh, for one pair of pants. I have the pair of feet for the other pair of pants. These two feet live in this unit normal bundle, which is parameterized by this torus. So if the two feet were exactly sticking opposite from each other, right, then the difference between them would be pi i, because one would be all the way around from the other. So we take the difference of the feet minus pi i, and we let that be our shear coordinate. All right? And that, again, lives, well, in this torus, z mod the half length of z with 2 pi i z, it lives in this torus, which is parameterizing our unit normal bundle. So that's my time clip. All right, so, um, so now I can define an R epsilon good panted surface. It's a good panted surface if all the cuffs have half length with an epsilon of R. So it should be made, in other words, out of good pants. And then the second condition is that the, um, the shear coordinates, and this is where we said we twist by one. So if we did not twist by one, we'd have all the these pants have large cuffs, so they come very close together. The cuffs come very close together. And if we didn't twist by one, then the place where the cuffs are coming close together would all kind of line up. And we'd have ex exponentially many of these kind of pinching places in a unit length. So that we'd have exponentially many bends adding up in a unit length. And by twisting by one, by sort of pushing the place where they come closest, sort of along uh, the geodesic, we sort of distribute the bending in this way. And so that's why we want our shear coordinates to be with an epsilon over r, not of 0, but of 1. Okay? And that's what we call a good panted surface in the 3 manifold. And again, if, this, if d is 2, then what we've made is an immersed panted surface in our given surface, so we could just Think of that as a cover, and it's just a kind of panted surface. And then we're just saying we're controlling the lengths of this TD6, and we're controlling these shears. Okay. In a three manifold, it's a little more subtle. We're looking at what we're actually doing in the three manifold. And then our theorem is that every good panted surface is pi one injective. So if we can get our immersed good panted surface in our two or three manifold. Well, that tells us that we win in the three-dimensional case. And in fact, we get this better statement that we can have this map of our parameterizing surface made out of our good pairs of pants. We map it to H2 or 3. And then we lift, well, we, we map it to our three-manifold or two-manifold. We lift it to H2 or H3. And then we look at its map on the boundary. And that's going to be 1 plus a constant times epsilon quasi-symmetric. All right, 10 minutes left. Well, wow. OK. So, um, so that's what gives us the Aaron price. It says that our, our map from our good panic surface to our given surface is, well, to the lift. When we lift it all up, we get something that's nearly quasi-conformal. OK, so. Um, so uh, we want to, how do we get these good panted surfaces? Well, we take all of our good pants and we look at the feet of all of our good pants. That lives in the square root of the normal bundle. And we want to say that it's evenly distributed to this exponentially small scale. So you can imagine what that means. I don't want to write it down. We have our torus and we look at all these points in the torus, which correspond to these feet. And we just look at like little squares of this exponentially small size, and we just count how many feet we have. 
in each of these squares, and we say that the number of feet we have in any two squares, the ratio should be this close to one. Okay, so they're very much evenly distributed. And then as a corollary, what we have is that for every translation from the unit normal bundle to the unit normal bundle, it's just a torque, so we have plenty of translations, we can approximate it up, we can approximate it by a permutation of the feet. So that the difference between the permutation and the translation is exponentially small. Okay? So we can pretty much move all the feet by any desired translation. And now, okay, so let's look at what we're doing in a three manifold. We want to build a good panted surface out of good pants. So we have our collection of good pants. We take two copies of each pair of pants and give them opposite orientations. And then we take a permutation. Remember, we can do this. We take a permutation from the feet to itself such that the um, permutation closely approximates um, translation by 1 plus i pi, right? Because our official shear coordinates, we have to subtract off this i pi. So this is the same, basically, as saying where we want shears by 1. Now, if we orient gamma, if we have an oriented pair of pants, we call it gamma positive if it induces that orientation of gamma. And we call it gamma negative if it induces the opposite orientation. And so we compare the gamma positive pair of pants with the foot n with the gamma negative pair of pants with foot sigma of n. And then we do this for all of our GD6. And we've obtained a good closed panted surface in M. And in fact, we've obtained an oriented good closed panted surface in M. So that finishes the story for a three manifold. Now let's look what happens on a two manifold. So here on a two manifold, our unit normal bundle has two components, right? And likewise, the square root of the unit normal bundle has two components, because the two feet still lie on the same side of a given geodesic. So a geodesic, you can just picture a simple one, right? It has two sides to the unit normal bundle, left side and the right side. And so this can provide an obstruction to putting together all of our good pants, because we can have more good pants on one side than on the other side. So we let q, gamma, epsilon, r, be rational sums of good curves. And we'll take a geodesic, and if we reverse the orientation of the geodesic, that's the same as negating it. And then we let q, pi, epsilon, r, be rational sums of good pants. And then we define this boundary operator from good pants to good curves. It's pretty much the obvious thing. We have a pair of pants with three boundary curves. The orientation of the, well, the pants is oriented, it's on a surface, so we get three oriented boundary curves. And, right, oriented so that the pants is on the left of each one, and that's our boundary map. And now if we have some positive integer sum of good pants, we can assemble these pants into a, a closed panted cover, if and only if we have the same number of curves on both sides of each geodesic, and that's the same as saying that the boundary of the sum of pants is zero. And so we want to correct the idea is that typically the boundary is not going to be zero. We know that it's small by this equilibrium distribution statement. So we need to find this correction function, this linear operator from curves to pants. So we want to find this linear map such that, first of all, it's a kind of pseudo inverse to the boundary operator. So boundary g boundary is boundary. And second of all, we want this kind of L infinity bound for this linear operator. So we have about e to the r pants. P is some polynomial in R. We have about e to the r pants um, where the given g sig is boundary. And so this is saying that our correction term for a given curve is kind of about evenly distributed on all the pants that have this curve as boundary. So it's about as good an estimate as we can get. And now, here we want to form the good pan and cover, given this correction function. So we let alpha be the sum of all good pants. And then we take boundary alpha, 
That's the discrepancy between the number on one side and the number on the other side. It's small compared to the total number of pants. And now we form this correction term beta by using our correction function. And then the boundary of the difference is zero. And alpha minus beta is an equidistributed and positive sum of good pants. So because we make a small, because boundary alpha is small compared to alpha, beta is small compared to alpha. And so we have a small perturbation. It's still equidistributed. So we can clear denominators and pair off the pants. We just make everything integral. We pair off the pants. We form a good pan and cover. And that proves the error first. So am I finished, Lib? How much? You can finish, or you have five more minutes. I have, I have five more minutes? All right. So let me just say a bit more about how. So here we've proven the Arnprey's conjecture given this function g. How do we make this function g? So let me just go through two more slides. So we have this, um, we wanted to find this good pants homology. It's good curves on boundary of good pants. So we have this natural map from a good curve is certainly a cycle. And the boundary of a good pants is certainly a boundary. So we have a natural ma map from the good pants homology to the singular homology. And we want to show that if something's zero in singular homology, if the sum of good curves is zero in singular homology, it's actually the boundary of a sum of good pants. So we prove this by a series of identities in the good pants homology. And then each identity, well, in some, we can write it in this form. And of course, to say that something's zero in good pants homology, it just means it's the boundary of some sum of good pants. So really, when you prove an identity, you're creating a witness. If you look at your proof carefully, you're creating a witness. And you're saying that something is the boundary of something else, which is the sum of good pants. And each of these GI functions, it's actually defined in terms of the previous functions, because an identity is proven in terms of the previous identities. And then our final function, G, is basically going to give us this pseudo inverse. You know, our final identity is if something's zero in singular homology, then we get this, um, this if something's zero in singular homology, then it's, the, it's zero in good pants homology, and therefore it's the boundary of some sum of good pants, and that gives us our pseudo inverse G. And then each time we sort of figure out what these functions are and define it in terms of previous functions, we have estimates on the norms of these functions to get an estimate on the norm of G. And maybe one more slide just to say, how do we prove this good pants homology? So we take a base point for our surface. We look at the elements of the fundamental group that have length at most r. And then we have an encoding of the other elements of the fundamental group in terms of elements of the good pants homology. And it satisfies the encoding of the product is the sum of the encodings. If we have any good curve, if we write it in the product of generators, it turns out to be equivalent in good pants homology to the sum of encodings of the generators. And that's enough, basically, to prove that the good pants homology is a singular homology. And just, uh, right. And so one last slide here. Uh, we can do the same thing in three, di three dimensions. We can realize, Lou and Markovich showed that if you have any zero homologous curve, it bounds a nearly geodesic and pi one objective surface, basically using good pants homology in three dimensions. And as an application of this theorem, they proved the virtual domination conjecture. Well, no, sorry, Hung Min Sun proved the virtual domination conjecture, which says that if you have a closed hyperbolic three manifold, then it has a finite cover which maps with positive degree to any other three manifold. So that's virtual domination. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so it's an excellent question. 
Um, <coughs> you could try, well, you could say, you know, for what class of compact manifolds can we hope to find a service subgroup, basically. And so, um, Ursula Hemmenstadt has proven basically that if you have a um, compact rank one locally symmetric space, then it also has this pi one injective immersed surface. Um, there's some technical issues which I'm working with her on, but essentially she proved this theorem. And we could have even further conjectures, sort of the strongest possible conjecture, I think, that can be approached really just using these methods is if you have a, an arbitrary locally compact, locally symmetric space. I think we should, we should be able to find these pi one injective immersed surfaces. And we should be able to basically say that whenever you have like a system of hyperbolic planes immersed in this rank one locally symmetric space, that we should be able to find a surface that kind of stays close to those planes. You know, yes? So, so what is the reason that you're looking for a surface group instead of a fundamental group of a higher dimensional hyperbolic manifold? The reason is that we believe that we can find them. <laughs> right? but, Our methods are to find surfaces. And of course, it would be wonderful. Like if we had a closed hyperbolic four manifold, we'd love to find immersed hyperbolic three manifolds or immersed three manifolds, period. But it's just much, much harder to do that. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank both speakers for the wonderful lecture.